Sparks Ranch. Um, this is a picture from about the 30s. Uh, the Arbuckles have traditionally been, uh, I would consider maybe a mixed grass prairie, depending on the rainfall. We have some tall grass prairie and some shorter grass prairie, but um, as, as you'll see today, the Arbuckles have changed a lot over the years. Uh, like I said, that was from the 1930s. Uh, when there was very, very little brush, very little tree cover. We go back and forth, and we're trying to figure out if it's 1919 or 1921 when it was established. But uh, it's, it's in the Arbuckle Mountains, it's a unique landscape. Uh, we have about 10,000 acres. Uh, of that, we have about 10 main pastures that range from 400 acres to almost 1,500 acres. So there's a lot of variability in how we manage those. Uh, mainly a cow-calf operation. Uh, we do a little bit of stalker uh, stuff, but it's mainly complementary to our cow-calf and it's about 90% 90, 90 native rangeland. Uh, management concerns, uh, she uh, sent me a list of potential management concerns and I went down the list and was just saying yes, 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 yes. So we have a lot of problems in the Arbuckles as you can see. Uh, it's not easy for anything to move around out there. That's a pasture that had just been burned. Uh, a lot of rock, uh, not much soil and you can see the woody encroachment that goes along with that. Um, it's uh, like you can see, it's really rough country, and, and we are dealing a little bit now uh, with some invasive uh, species, invasive grasses. And uh, as you can imagine, without being able to walk, there's very poor grazing distribution. And uh, we tend to try and fix that with fire. Uh, it solves a lot of problems we have, or if it doesn't solve it, it helps us manage around it. This is what it'll look like after we burn and it greens up a little bit. Um, as you can see, there's still a lot of rock and the cattle have to deal with it, so it, it takes some special management. We ranch in northwest Oklahoma, and uh, this operation, like it was pointed out, started in 1908. Um, we operate leased acres primarily, uh, so we have a special set of challenges there in working around landowners. We're cur currently operating about 50,000 acres. 40,000 of those acres are in southern Ellis County and butt right up against the Pack Saddle Wildlife Refuge on their north perimeter. So we operate from kind of Pack Saddle back to the north. We have a variety of landscapes, a variety of challenges. Most of our country is tall grass, prairie, sand, shinry, uh, a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of oak in those, in those places. We also spill over into some red shale hills off to the east, uh, deep canyons in, in that area, uh, a little tighter soil, short grass, uh, a little more drought prone. Uh, we also lease a ranch in uh, northern, more northern Ellis County between Gage and Fargo. That property is mostly sand also. North end it gets into some uh, caliche bluffs and some of that kind of stuff. Uh, We've used fire forever on that ranch. We haven't used it near enough. Uh, primary limitations are uh, moisture. Uh, we've done traditional burning with uh, spring burns. We haven't done any summer burns other than a, some uh, erratic lightning fires. So uh, we are checking out the summer burning. We're interested in it. We'd like to try some of it, but we don't have any experience with it. Um, our burn intervals are erratic. Uh, we would love to have a set plan that we're going to burn this number of acres this year, this number of acres next year, and so on and so forth. Those things tend to get dictated to us by, uh, by weather and drought. Um, the, this last spring, we didn't get to burn anything. We had about 5,000 acres prepped and ready to go and just weren't able to get it done. Uh, it's, it's kind of been our goal the last several years is to try to burn about 10% of the acres that we're operating. Our pasture sizes range in, in sizes from uh, 3,000 acres to four or 500 acres. So we have a lot of different sizes and pastures. Um, as far as our, uh, the attitude to fire in our area, uh, there's, been a, there's been a lot of burning in our area the last 20 years. I've seen a lot more burning uh, in the last 20 years than I did previously. So I think that's a positive change in our area. Uh, and I think there's been uh, better, better management because of it. Um, one of the problems that has affected our area most recently, and you all have been aware of it, uh, is the, the large wildfires out in that area. I think those are partly attributed to 
to uh, good grass management and uh, partly attributed to poor brush management. Uh, but some of those fires have been, been large scale and, and, uh, and uh, have ca caused big concerns in the area. We haven't been affected by those ourselves. We've had them all around us, but haven't got one to come across us. Uh, it would probably simplify a lot of things for us if one did. But uh, it's a, it, and I think that's one of the things that I was talking to Laura about it. One of the challenges we have is, is just uh, managing relations within our area and within our with our neighbors. I'm, I don't get so concerned about liability from a dollar standpoint as I do is managing liability from a relationship standpoint with my neighbors. Um, anyway, uh, we're cow-calf operation. Um, we also retain those calves through a stalker program on the feedlot and so on and so forth, which gives us some flexibility during times of drought as far as uh, managing stocking rates. So I don't know if that kind of covers the, the basics. I'll turn it over to Scott. Uh, just like you said, that my name is Scott Stout. I'm from uh, southwest Nebraska around the Curtis area, which is about 35 miles south of North Platte. Uh, our ranch primarily is in the Los Canyon region, uh, a lot of uh, steep terrain, uh, a lot of cedar trees, you know, roughly, you know, anywhere from 20% on the south end and get up towards the north end of that canyon area, you know, 50, 60% canopied. So there's a lot of cedar trees and a lot of rough ground. Um, my father-in-law, I, I uh, operate a cow-calf operation in that area. Um, we're probably primarily a tall grass prairie, other than the cedar trees. We haven't got them to eat those yet. Um, so we used started using fire oh, about uh, about 12 years ago on our operation. Um, I've been I've been a member for about 12 years and actually used our fire on our operation about 10 years. Um, we uh, are a member of the Prescribed Burn Association there in Curtis or in that area. It's called the Los Canyon Rangeland Alliance. We have about 85 members. Uh, we uh, do a lot of, a lot of burning in the spring is primarily, we have uh, done a few summer burns now that got on our belt that uh, we've seen the impacts from that, uh, really like the results so far. Um, as an operation, we uh, retain our calves usually in a backgrounding situation, sell and uh, usually uh, feeder cattle in January. Um, we raise our own bulls, we raise our own replacement heifers. Um, since we've been burning, we've uh, seen about a, we were able to about, seen about a 15% increase in our herd size, able by, by providing the fire uh, to the operation. Um, as a group, or as a burn group, we were, we were kind of spread out on that 180,000 acres to try to get across. So we don't try to, we're not burning on our operation every year, but we try to do large scale burns. Um, they seem like they're growing every year. Uh, we have a lot of 3,500 acre burns, you know, one unit to get done here in the near future. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're focusing on right now. In 2002, right, there's a, the drought came through Nebraska and it was pretty severe at that point in time. We increased our acres from that area. Uh, it was taking us about 15 to 17 acres of cow-calf pair to, in order to uh, summer those cows and it was only for five months. So, uh, you know, you really have to evaluate your operation when it, when it starts impacting the financial benefits of, of that operation. So. Um, we really sat down and tried to figure out what we, can we do to increase productivity off our own property instead of having to go out and, and uh, lease an additional, you know, twice the amount of acres so we can just run our, our same cow herd, size cow herd. So what we did uh, was evaluate our property and, you know, we knew the cedar trees were a problem. You know, what can we do about it? At that point in time, there was not a lot of burning, not a lot of... Uh, people addressing the, the situation that we had in front of us. So um, we went to work with our local NRCS groups, uh, Pheasants Forever Game and Parks groups, and it come down to basically a little bit of mechanical and a lot of burning, and that's pretty much what started off from there. For us, we, the, the ranches use fire 
as far as I know, forever. Um, it, it was easier, uh, like that, that picture that Dylan showed of their ranch a while ago, I, those old photographs I've seen, uh, the ranch was extensively overgrazed. There was very few eastern red cedars. Uh, anything that sprouted got nipped off at the ground. So they could go out, light fire around the perimeter of the ranch and it was gonna go out somewhere, no problems. So fire has been used for forever on, on that operation. Uh, as grazing management got better, it, it caused some other problems with, in, with brush encroachment. Um, and uh, I'm not sure there's any cows left that would, could survive on some of the things those cows did thanks to our, all of our breeding techniques through the years. But anyway, um, so, so it's been used forever on that operation. Uh, it, it's essential to us for cedar control. Uh, we, we have a constant problem with, with encroachment on cedars. Uh, Shinry, I, the, the uh, Oklahoma Wildlife Department has done a lot of research on using fire for shinry control. And uh, I've, they have had a lot of success with it. The key, what I've seen is the key to that for them has been a consistent, constant burning. And with our livestock operation and having to maintain a maximum stocking rate, whatever that is, uh, to maintain profitability, it makes it really hard in those dry rainfall years to always get that burn pulled off. So our primary reason has been for cedar control, uh, has been our primary reason for, for burning. In Sparks Ranch, uh, John Sparks is my father and he is the one who implemented our burn program. He started in the late 80s, early 90s and it was 100% for cedar control. Uh, he recognized that especially Arbuckle Mountains of Southern Oklahoma, that cedars were gonna be the biggest battle of his life. Um, several ranches in the area have been uh, pretty much just completely taken over by cedars and almost ruined. I don't know if you've been through Turner Falls. Uh, when they built that road in the 1920s, it was almost 100% open prairie, and now it's 100% cedar tree. So we started our burn program for cedars and only for cedars and uh, pretty much um, wiped out the cedar trees on our property. Now the only cedar trees left are in areas where uh, cedar trees are about the only thing that can grow and that's okay because it's, uh, it's good for wildlife as long as it's not uh, becoming a problem and encroaching in your rangeland. Um, I personally have burned my whole life. Uh, I'm 30 years old so I was a, a kid when my dad started burning pretty much and I spent spring break every year of my life with a, a shovel and a cedar limb setting fire lines. And uh, I've seen a big improvement over my lifetime um, as far as our, our neighbors. When, when I was a, a young boy uh, setting fire line, it would be that our neighbor does not want to burn, will not burn, and he's going to be mad if he gets over there. So we would go down some really terrible hills. You, you saw the rocks that we have to deal with. It was all on foot by hand setting fire lines. And over the years, it's become more common here, uh, thanks to a lot of different avenues, but most recently the prescribed burn associations. Uh, now we burn with neighbors, burn bigger areas, use more definite fire breaks, more natural fire breaks, bigger roads, and include multiple landowners. And it's really made a huge difference. And now we're transitioning more towards woody encroachment. It's become a pretty big deal over the last um, 30 years as we focus on the cedars, the woody encroachment is, has come on. So now we're, we're really starting to battle that. Um, and I, I think the key to the woody encroachment, like he said, it's just a constant, continuous burn uh, that slowly, slowly fights them back and pushes them away. And you, you gain a little bit of ground every year, but it's a, it's a process that you have to have to buy into and, and, and keep doing. As far as the nutrition of our grass, it's, it's pretty consistent. The research that's out there with uh, like yearlings, wean calves and such of, of increasing gain because of burned native grass. Uh, I think we see that pretty consistently in our cow herd. 
Uh, I haven't seen much research. It may be out there. I don't know if any of you know of it, but uh, what economic impact, uh, say, a spring burn has on a spring calving uh, herd of cattle. Uh, from what I've seen, it's, it's pretty high. Uh, I, think, uh, I think spring burns on a spring calving cow herd have a really big increase in uh, conception rate, a uh, big increase in weaning weight and overall profitability. Uh, I would guess that I was uh, playing with an enterprise budget this morning. I would guess on a 100 cow herd, um, just some general guesses from what I've seen, uh, you can increase pretty easily three to $5,000 in profit on a spring calving cow herd uh, of 100 cows just because of a spring burn. So uh, it's something that we're really committed to uh, as far as forage production, forage quality. Uh, it greatly increases quality. Uh, I see, I've seen absolutely no decrease in forage production with my exclosures. I have both short-term and long-term exclosures. Uh, fire, um, if anything, my, uh, from what I've seen, has either no, no change uh, or maybe a little increase. As far as your, uh, as your diversity of your forage, I've seen nothing but an increase in forage diversity uh, with my uh, big four grasses. Uh, I've seen a lot of increase in some of those. Uh, as far as your forb and legume production, uh, from what I've seen in early spring burn, has no negative effect whatsoever on forbs and legumes. If anything, uh, early spring burn increases your, your beneficial uh, forbs and legumes. Uh, and, and those only increase your, your cattle production, your gain, uh, stuff like that. But I've seen a little bit, depending on the timing of the burn, and, and, and I mean, conditions are so variable. And to, to, expect, to expect one thing from one year to the next is really uh, dangerous in a way. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Uh, the year before last, we burned a, a large pasture where we run our yearling cattle. And so I had that pasture stocked lightly uh, and burned it, had it about half stocked. Uh, it turned off a little bit dry after the burn and had to burn a little bit later than I wanted to. Didn't get the quantity I wanted in that pasture but had an obvious increase in quality, which increased my, the weights on those yearling steers when I pulled them out. About 50, roughly 50 pounds increase on those steers from an average. However, I was half stocked at what I would have typically been had I not burned that pasture. So there, there's definitely some costs associated there. I, you know, a lot of times we figure these costs on burning these pastures Depending on your weather conditions, you may have some costs as a, as a ranch uh, related to uh, changes you have to make in, in grazing distribution and adjustments uh, there. Um, but, uh, but the long term, so, ne so now we're a year later, and, and the long term effects on that pasture are obvious uh, that, that we've got an increase, an increase in grass production in that pasture this summer. So seeing how that's gonna affect you this year after the burn, conditions are so critical. And of course, we, we operate on an average annual rainfall out there of about 22 inches. And so uh, the timing of that rainfall, uh, conditions surrounding your burn are, are, all, are all critical. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's all I'd say on that. Uh, we're in a little different area, or a little different uh, stage. Uh, we're trying to change a region more than we are. There's no doubt in my mind that our fire has been increasing forage quality and quantity, which really is dependent on our annual rainfall for that year. Um, we're more looking at trying to change that region more than we are trying to increase forage quality. Um, we're trying to change a area from completely, you know, somewhat covered by cedar trees to a, maybe back to a grassland prairie. So our main objective right now is to kill cedar trees and we try to, our objectives are to do so and that's, that's primarily it. The added benefits of fire is uh, that forage, for extra forage quality compared to before um, where we had a lot of small buffalo grass, you know, undesirable grasses that really don't put a lot of weight on cattle. So. Um, 
our objectives are a lot different than a lot of other people. We're just trying to change that region back to what it originally was, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Noticeably, no. Um, as far as the uh, uh, the the only really thing that we really have seen is, like I said, the you know changing those acres back to the to the higher quality and in, and increasing the amount of of uh, animals per that unit. So yeah, we really haven't seen any uh, uh, effects from the uh, bugs or anything. So yeah, I haven't seen any effects related to parasites or any anything like that. And I, on our deal, the only thing I, I would say as far as better performance on back to performance on cattle, uh, I know a lot of people maybe in this uh, this conference don't don't uh, use very much chemical. I'm, I'm I'll I love to spray brush as much as I love to burn it. Anything that'll kill it. Uh, and we've used some tebuthion on some of that uh, uh, some of that uh, shino had. In generic, gotten some uh, partnerships with some landlords on that, been able to make it work uh, economically, and then come in three years later and run a fire across it and had tremendous results on grass production. Uh, and been able to uh, immediately increase carrying capacity in those pastures by 20 to 30 percent. That, that pencils, uh, that, that works. And, and what I've been amazed with is the body condition on those cattle. Those cattle have, the body condition scores on those cattle have come up a full point, uh, essentially no matter which time of year, uh, whether you're weaning them in the fall or going through the winter and coming off in March or April and go in and evaluate them at that point. So we're really happy with those results and, and fire's definitely been a big part of that, of that program. Uh, on our ranch, we, um on part of it, we've kind of been doing a little bit of an experiment. Uh, we have a two pasture block that we've been, uh, it, the year before last we burned about 75% of it and this year we burned about uh, 85 to 90% of it. And part of that was patch burn um, and it really altered the grazing distribution of the cattle. Uh, I really moved them around with fire and this year, uh, kind of the first year I paid attention to it, I guess. And I think I saw a decrease in the fly load on those cattle. Uh, we fly tagged this year and my cattle were the last cattle uh, in that area to be fly tagged. And uh, you know, we were almost a month behind when we first started having bad enough flies to start tagging to when I tagged those. And uh, at the time I tagged them, they still weren't at a terrible fly level and um, I think Maybe the being able to delay the fly tagging compared with and combined with the lighter fly load through the summer, uh, and the other fly tags have worn off. And these are, I don't know if it's the fly tags or uh, because of the burning, but uh, I've made it through pretty much the entire fly season without needing to reapply anything, without ever going down there and thinking those cows had a, a bad fly load. So I think I'm starting to see some positive benefits. We'll see. If it's a year thing, if it's uh, strictly a burning thing or a combination of burning and fly tags we use, but it's definitely something that we're going to look at going forward. So in uh, 2008, there was a big wildfire, 2007-2008, um, uh, here uh, locally. Um, where it burned, we, we weren't focusing on cedars, so we hadn't been burning this area prior to that burn. And uh, it was a really extreme fire um, because of the combination of the woody encroachment and the grass that was there. Uh, but I am now, because we didn't reburn it because of the drought that showed up and a lot of different factors, we didn't keep burning it after that wildfire. And the amount of good that wildfire did uh, is going to take me years and years and years to try and replicate with prescribed fire. So yeah, the wildfire in a sense was was bad for us. It they never come to a good time. They never come to a good place. But if you manage around that and accept it as kind of part of your ecosystem, 
uh, that wildfire did a heck of a lot of good for us and it's going to take me 15 years of burning to try and replicate and get back to where we started with the day after that wildfire came through. Yeah, I've experienced the same thing Dylan's describing here. Um, <clears throat> we had a large wildfire come right through the middle of the ranch, really took a swath right through the middle of it, burned, uh, oh, burned about 20% uh, of the main body of the ranch. And uh, yeah, it was disturbing at the time when it happened. It was, was in 2008. Did you say that was in your I, I think so. I was saying. Yeah, it's when, that's when ours, ours happened. It was before all those. At that time, that was the big fire out there that everybody's talking about. <laughs> well, nobody even remembers that now. But it, it, did, a lot of, it did a lot of good um, and really jumped us ahead in some of those pastures. It, I probably wouldn't, still wouldn't have got to them. So, yeah, but it, it does cause for some challenges in management in those years that that happens. As Dylan said, the uh, burn interval, or the extreme conditions, uh, I think that expands your burning intervals back to where, you know, your regrowth isn't near as current. Right now we're running, you know, we were planning on that five to 10 year range before our, in our burn intervals, but you know, it's, it's gonna maybe be a little quicker than that on our, on our burn intervals, but that wildfire, it expanded that out 10, 15 years, like Dylan said, in order to, before that's gonna actually, you know, we are starting to see regrowth back in that, and that was in 2002. So that was, it's, it's, it's pretty a, a phenomenal thing, I guess, but it is scary at the time. Those things have been discussed around here. I probably should have been here yesterday. I wish I could have been, but I probably have something more intelligent to talk about. But um, I think that I, th I think there's always caution that needs to be used and timing, it, and it depends a lot on your location, your rainfall, your annual rainfall, and some of those kind of things. But as far as any, you know, any, whatever risks are out there are far overshadowed by the rewards. Um, you know, there's lots of information, lots of uh, lots of good resources to get help to, if if you haven't ever done it. Uh, so I think the the risks by far uh, are overshadowed by the rewards. Um, as far as the the relations, and it, it, it's come we've come a long ways, like Dylan pointed out, and and sounds like you guys up there also. There's a lot more people in burning, interested in burning, learning about it, and uh, and and I think we've come a long ways in regard to that. The Arnett area where I live, people, a lot of people have burned around there forever. Active fire department, uh, those guys, they love people to light fires. Uh, so uh, it's you know it, it's there's usually no problems in that area. That ranch I was, talked about that we leased between Fargo and Gage, they never burn up there, never. Those folks have never burned. And the uh, landlords on that ranch got involved in the prairie chicken program, and so they've got some requirements related to burning, and, and we, we are uh, designated as the ones to carry out those plans. So uh, when, we had, had, when we first had to start burning those pastures, the first year we really had to, to do a major burn up there was that spring uh, after the big fire in uh, Kansas. And we had literally had our, uh, there were, our fences were lined with neighbors with binoculars watching us do that burn. Mm -hmm. uh, we pulled it off, no problems. Conditions were fine. They were plenty dangerous, but we knew it was the only opportunity we had. Um, but everybody was everybody was watching and waiting for something to go wrong i don't i have no i had no fear of any of those folks uh coming to litigation with us or suing us or any of that kind of stuff but it was purely a relationship deal and it helped for them to see us pull that off successfully and and watch us through their binoculars and how we did it it gave them some confidence in that and in, in being able to do that so it's really important that you do it right when you do it and I don't say that to discourage anybody from doing it, but it needs to be done appropriately. The Los Canyon Rangeland Alliance was established in uh, 2002 with, I think, six landowners. Um, and like I said, we did not have that, that fire 
mentality at that point in time as everything was just really new to people and it I mean they went out there with you know pitchforks and shovels and a couple of tractors and you know try went away and the drip I think one had one or two drip torches and uh, they went and pulled off a little burn and they thought maybe that was just the way to go so uh, it kind of just held kind of stale for till about 2006 we had some agency people involved um, they did their first big burn in that in about that time frame and from that point on it just really took off um, we've grown to about 85 ish uh, members uh, consisting mostly of landowners there's a few agency people on there um, we've uh, grown to about over oh, 150 160 thousand dollars worth of equipment um, owned by the by the uh, group but it's a landowner helping landowner philosophy uh, we have we do these burns and it's really no really no expense other than the day of the burn for those landowners to come have that 80 people show up to your burn um, it kind of it's kind of a management pain but other than that it's it's really nice to have that following when you go do a burn and you know how you'll have plenty of people when you're doing you know 3500 acres 2600 acre burns you need a lot of people when you have a you know pretty large amount of trees you need to burn and it's nice having those people there to watch your back when you're while you're doing this kind of stuff um, it's uh there is a lot of interest in that area we you know the landowners helping their neighbors helping neighbors and when we first started there's a lot of neighbors that did not want fire on their property uh, they didn't quite see the big picture of it. Now they've come to see the overall benefits of it all. So we're getting burn units that have, you know, 8, 10, 12 different landowners within it. So it's really nice to have all those members or all those people on, in, on the same page as a prescribed burn group. Um, we have a lot of acres to go across. I think we're, we have one, we said our region, it got to be really big there in that uh, 300,000 acres where it seemed like we were going, you know, everywhere trying to get something accomplished. And it was just little spots, little spots here and there. So we kind of uh, reduced our target area to uh, about 180,000 acres of where our kind of our core group is maintained through there. So um, that's our target area right now. And we've burned, oh, roughly 60,000 acres, maybe a little bit more on 70 some different burns. And this is all since about 2008 so it's been it's uh it's coming around fast and i think we've kind of changed a lot of the persona of people in that area even even the in large population areas uh you see it on the news and stuff you know it's just them guys down south burning again so it, it's it's kind of nice to be accepted like that on our ranch when we consider costs um our out-of-pocket costs usually isn't very high. We have, um, as far as equipment on our ranch, we have a cattle sprayer that we've had for 100 years, and we have um, a couple of sprayers for Polaris's that we got at Tractor Supply. I think they were 150 bucks a piece. And then we have some, um, some backpack sprayers and drip torches. So our total out-of-pocket uh, isn't real high. Um, our setup is we have employees that um, it's, it's an owner, myself, and one employee, and it's more allocating our current resources. So we decide to burn instead of do something else. So there's costs there. Um, that's kind of hard to figure out. And as far as the return, uh, you know, I, I think if you look at long-term uh, return is the way to look at it. Um, it would be really hard for me to put a value on it. So, you know, if we were to hire somebody to come in and cut stuff, it's what, 100, 150 bucks an hour for a machine. And if you think 10,000 acres and the rate at which woody encroachment is going, you know, and cedar trees, if you're just to worry about the cost of maintaining that, it would be extremely high. And then that's not including our cattle performance benefits to wildlife. Uh, I would say, in my opinion, um, probably your two biggest returns on your dollar are going to be burning and maybe an implant and an unweaned calf. 
Um, I think it's, it would be, I've never tried to put a dollar figure on it. I'm sure there's smarter people than me that have, but I would say there's probably nothing you can do in the Southern Plains that's a bit better return on your investment than burning. Uh, I think I deal with it on our ranch right now. Um, you know, my dad's kind of a, a gap generation between the generation that was, hell no, you better not let that fire get on my grass because I'm going to need it, and this kind of newer generation that's more uh, ecologically centered. So he grew up in that one generation and had to change his mind and the entire way he thinks about ranching over his lifetime by himself. So. Uh, I think when you look at that, um, the biggest challenge is maintaining a burn interval. Uh, I think sometimes we get discouraged because we light one heck of a fire. We go back three years later and it kind of looks the same because we didn't burn again. And the reason that's hard is you got to do something with your cattle, right? If you're a, a stalker operator, it's a little easier because you're probably seasonally grazing. But as a cow-calf producer, whether you have one pasture or you have 20, uh, it's the hardest thing is managing your grazing system and timing and style to make those burns possible. And, and like Weston was saying, you know, uh, another part of that is you get a few pastures burned and it doesn't rain. And, oh crap, I'm in drought mode, I'm not burning anymore. And then you miss that burn window and maybe it rains again or maybe it doesn't. So that's a challenge and, and we face it now and we're starting to fix that with patch burns. So I, I'm starting to look at uh, a lot of times not even moving cattle out of a pasture, just changing what part of my pasture they're in and then picking a really defined fire break and burning from that fire break to the other side of the pasture to the other side of a burn unit or doing a pasture and a half in a burn unit and putting all my cows in that half of the pasture that I'm not going to burn because it becomes a time issue, it becomes just a logistics issue to try and move cows around to allow burning to be successful. And I, I think we can fix that through patch burning or burning bigger blocks and moving your cows to the side where you can bring them right back in. We started way too late in our area. We, I mean, it was a problem before we even got started. So they're playing, starting from behind, the way I see that needs to in, do the amount of uh, acres that we need to get done is going to have to be large extreme acres that uh, eventually we're going to have have to do those you know 20 thirty thousand acre blocks in order to main, try to get accomplished what we need to accomplish. The problem with doing that or, and using natural barriers instead of having to go out and build burn lines and stuff like that. The problem with doing that within those canyons or those ranges or units there's a, probably going to be five, six different landowners that their entire operation lies within those. So our, our problem is where, what do we do with that livestock? Why uh, we're trying to line those up? You know, uh, it's broadening our, our, burning, our, our burning windows, but yet we're, how are we going to control the ability to do those acres and find a place for those livestock owner, or owners' livestock to go while we're doing those. So um, that's probably one of a one of the huge issues we see as being able to burn and achieve what we need to be achieving. Mm -hmm.